please continue, Natasha. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. In a few minutes, we will begin the first session of the Southeast Asia Sustainability Festival 2022. On behalf of the committee, I would like to thank you all for attending the first session this evening. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind you of your arrangement for tonight's event. All participants may mute the microphone, turn on their cameras, and use the virtual background we provide. Please kindly set your name on your Zoom with the format of your country underscore your name. Please fill in the Google Form attendance list provided in the chat box. Please note that only volunteers who attend till the end of the first session will, re will receive full 100 points. And if you have any questions for our speakers, please type them in the chat box during the Q&A session. We would be really delighted if you share your experience during the first session and tag us on your Instagram story. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the honorable speakers, moderator, promoters, and volunteers, it is an honor for me, Natasha Siandi, to be your host for the first session of the Southeast Asia Sustainability Festival 2022. For our first agenda for tonight's event, I would like to highlight the reason why we are conducting this event. Southeast Asia Sustainability Festival 2022 is a good moment to exchange experiences and knowledge from the youth-led movement around the world. Supported by YCLE Cultural Vista, U.S. Embassy Philippine, this event aimed to achieve sustainable development goals based on evidence-based and good governance on multiple regional actors. The CASF will provide you with new knowledge from diverse viewpoints about the nexus of thriving societies, prosperous economy, healthy environment, partnership for the goals and individual empowerment. By taking part in the CISF, you will witness and be the young change maker with a direct impact in making a huge change in the society. The honorable speakers, moderator, promoters or organizational partners and volunteers, now we will witness to welcome remarks from the committee of CISF, Mr. Basri Hasanuddin Latif. So let us welcome Mr. Basri Hasanuddin Latif. Good night, everyone. I think I still don't hear any response here. Good night, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, thank you. Greetings, youth speakers, volunteers, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank to every one of you for being here with us today. We are pleased to welcome you on the first session of Southeast Asia Sustainability Festival 2022. As I mentioned last night in the opening session, this program is a one month program to share good practices and platform of action in effort to achieve sustainable development goals or SDGs based on the evidence base and good governance of multiple actors in the region. There are 17 SDGs, which can be grouped into four big themes. These 
Philippines are the basis of the Southeast Asia Sustainability Festival program that we attend tonight. And tonight, we will learn how multiple actors contribute to one of the theme, which is thriving societies. Mr. Genius Umar, Mr. Andy Kopada Alegre, moderator, host, organization partners, and all volunteers, we couldn't have done it without you. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to take too much of the time, so I will give a warm welcome to from the deep of our heart. Do enjoy the festival. Please ask through the chat box during the presentation and do the challenge happily. Thank you very much for your sincere attention. Thank you and enjoy the session. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Basri Hasanuddin Latif, who has delivered the opening remarks for tonight's event. Distinguished speakers and volunteer, we will move forward to the main session. There will be two speakers for tonight's event. Genius Umar, who is a mayor of Parliament City, and also Andy Copada Alegre, International Justice Commission from the Philippines. But first, let me introduce you to the moderator in charge, Ms. Arfi Santos. Arfi Santos is a Latin honor graduate of the University of Santa Tomas, Manila, with a degree in philosophy. She is pursuing her Juris Doctor degree in the same university. Ms. Santos served as the national president of Association of Youth Volunteers in the Philippines, vice president of Training, Exchange, and Development of Asian Lao Student Association, and wisely alumna and the former national director for education and research of the Youth for Human Rights and Democracy. Now, let me hand over to next session to the moderator. Let us welcome Ms. Santos. Thank you, Natasha, for that warm introduction. To our speakers and participants, a wonderful evening to all of you. Again, I am the Vice President for Asian Law Students Association Philippines, a human rights advocate and social justice advocate. And I will be your moderator for tonight's session, Thriving Societies. Tonight, I'm sure all of us are excited to learn about the role of young people in promoting good governance and how civic engagement is vital in achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we have a great lineup of speakers to enlighten us on these topics. So without further ado, let me introduce to all of you our first speaker. He holds a doctoral in natural resources and environmental management science from IPB University. He is a current mayor of Parliament City. He was a vice mayor of Parliament City from 2013 to 2018. He started his career as a civil servant in 1994 and reached his career peak as a head of vice chairman secretary of the Regional Representative Council. He then retired as a civil servant and was elected as vice mayor of Parliament City in 2013. He became the mayor of Parliament City in 2018. So during his term as mayor, he has actively run several programs in order to combat poverty. Currently, there are six major achievements towards zero poverty. First, 100% free education. Second, 99.6 universal health coverage. Third, 91.78% livable home. Fourth, 91.1% access to adequate drinking water. Fifth, 52.29% access to decent sanitation. And finally, 72.68% road stability. His major breakthrough was when he could open 16 roads around 40 kilometers without support from the regional budget. So due to his excellent efforts, he most of the time was awarded by several organizations with a total of 24 awards. And the current one is when he was awarded an Innovative Government Award on 20, this 2022 as the most innovative city. So everyone, let us all welcome the mayor of Pariyaman City, West Sumatra, Indonesia, Mr. Genius Umar. Give him a round of applause. Mr. Genius, are you ready for your presentation?
Berapa orang pesertanya? Yeah. Good evening, Mayor. Yes. So we are very glad to have you here in tonight's uh, webinar. So we are now uh, opening the stage to you for your uh, discussion tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy to have an opportunity to speak along of you for around, around uh, so I think so, so many countries come to invite it to this seminar. I'm uh, Jenny Sumar, I'm mayor of Pariaman city there in West Sumatra, Indonesia. So I have an uh, opportunity to talk about the poverty elev elevation in Pariaman city. Huh? Sorry. Okay. Sini. Klik dulu tengah. Okay. Pariaman in West Sumatra is next to Padang City. Our vision is a uh, Pariaman City. City of tourism, trade, religious, and cultural service. We have uh, three topics of discussion. One, poverty in Pariaman City. Second, poverty reduction program, the program and activity that have been carried out related to poverty reduction in Pariaman City. And third is constraint and challenge. Constraint and challenge in poverty elevation. Pariaman City economic growth compared to West Sumatra province, our growth is uh, is better than uh, uh, province of uh, West Sumatra. So in 1980, the growth is uh, four, 5 .4, 4, 4, 4, Four seven and nineteen twenty nineteen nineteen is a uh, five point three, and uh, under COVID we are minus one point six one point three zero. I mean, and uh, so in in twenty twenty on the uh, COVID disaster, and now in twenty twenty one we're going up, going up to three. Point uh, five three, and now twenty twenty two. We are going to uh, our growth is uh, five. So so the economic is going growth now. This is the poor resident. This is the poor residents of Parliament City, in under even for under COVID, we can stable. It's about. Uh, in 2018 is a five zero three, in 2019 is four point seventy six, in 2020 is four point one, and four point three eight on uh, uh, 2021, and now it's going up. So this is uh, uh, we have so many policy uh, to to assist uh, our poor people not to be bad, but going go, going good because so many program, especially in uh, agriculture on COVID-19 be doing it. And also so many social uh, assistance uh, for our poor people, we, we, we do that. Okay. This is line of property. This is the Gini ratio. Um, uh, there, there was a significant increase in the Gini ratio in 2020 due, due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was successfully lowered back in the 2021 with the same position before the COVID-19 pandemic. 
<clears throat> what is extreme poverty? Extreme property, it is some um, extreme property condition where people welfare, sorry. Uh, extreme property is condition is the where people refer is below to extreme property line or equivalent to uh, one point uh, one dollar and nine US, US, US dollar purchasing power proper parity or equivalent to uh, 28 rupiah per capita. Extreme poverty in Parliament City was relative hike in 2020 and decreased in 2021 and 2022. This is a synergy collaboration program, property elevation. This is uh, our policy, how to, to combat the property elevation by the synergy of the program and also the collaboration of the program. In education, Property elevation through free education and also scholarship for the university, especially in uh, skill based uh, university and Pariaman smart card and free, uh, free school bus. Um, and also in healthcare, property elevation through free health service, healthy Pariaman card, free maternity guarantee, and also infrastructure. Property elevation through through the improved road access, access to drinking water, and adequate sanitation. This is uh, the synergy and program property elevation on economic and social property elevation through the Pariaman Jatra program. This uh, that's we call in the English uh, uh, Pariaman welfare welfare program uh, by an and inhabitable house assistances. We have we have the the poor house of poor house to be to be to be um, I mean to be re rehabilitation, healthy latrine assistance, and facilitation and assistance for capital and business facility for a small enterprise, seed assistance, basic food assistance. The third, digital market development for cheap food bazaar, job seeker distribution, development of the tourist potential through sport tourism, ecotourism, and tourism village. The fourth strategy, that we have a four strategy for fertility elevation by redux, re, reducing, re, reducing, re, reduce expenses, expense, increase ability and income, and uh, and develop and ensure the sustainability of micro, small, and medium enterprise, and uh, increase policy synergy and property uh, reduction. This performance achievement toward zero property. 100% free education, this is um, our achievement. 99.6% universal health coverage. Almost whole, all uh, Pariaman population uh, was uh, handled by uh, uh, insurance of uh, health. And 91%, 91.78% livable home, and 91.10% access to adequate drinking water, and 42 0.59% access to death and sanitation, and 72.68% uh, road stability. So we have almost all road is a very good. The constraint and challenge. There are many constraints and challenge in property elevation. Constraint one, limitation of local finance capacity to carry out integrated property elevation. The second is handling program to the central government funding is 
relatively sectoral and has a provision according to the technical structure of each ministry state agency. And third is management of integrated poor population data information system is not yet in optimum as a valid as a, an accurate database. Challenge that uh, ensure that recipient of property elevation program are right on target. Second, creating innovation is handling property in the integrated manner through program convergence and uh, realizing Pariaman zero property. So some uh, challenge is uh, how we challenge with the limitation budget after a pandemic of it. Now I challenge you never too young to fight property, what you can do. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, some attraction the annual attraction in Pariaman that we call Tabui is a cultural event, uh, economic that. driver of Pariaman city. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Omar, for that very detailed discussion. I'm sure our participants learn many best practices and strategies to combat poverty in our respective communities. So we are now opening the floor for any questions or clarifications to our first speaker. To our audiences in the YouTube Live, please comment your questions and we will assist you in asking them to our speaker. So now we have here this question. Uh, Mayor Omar, how can the youth be encouraged to participate in governance and why is it important for young people to work with the government in doing their initiatives? Pardon? The, the voice is not so clear. Can you repeat it again? Yes. Um, how can the youth be encouraged to participate in governance? Okay. So we, we developed this city under many innovation, innovating for, from the youth. So we have a, a youth center in Pariaman, and also we have, a, I have some uh, uh, youth forum here to, to give me some suggestion and also some uh, uh, input to the policy maker here. So especially in the sport, so we have, a, uh, so many, uh, 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 I mean, sport tourism here uh, that based on the youth uh, idea in innovation. And also, we have some um, small enterprise in Pariaman. The some policy of me is based on the uh, idea, idea of uh, from the youth also, and also some many activity. So that's why we have a uh, um, Pariaman uh, resilient is uh, based on youth. So on the pandemic COVID uh, problem that we, we face today, so some uh, our resilient policy is uh, based on uh, youth uh, idea, this one. Thank you, Mayor. So I'm very thanked for the Thank youth you. people in Pariaman. Thank you, Mayor, for explaining to us how Pariaman uh, how Parliament serves as inspiration to other cities in the South Asia and all over the world in order to achieve uh, zero poverty. So we also have here other questions from our dear participants. So our dear participants, uh, you could ask your questions directly to our speakers. So you could just raise your hand and I will acknowledge your uh, name. So we have here from Nigeria, uh, Muhammad Bashi. Uh, you could, I would like to call on Muhammad Bashi to uh, raise their question to our Mayor Omar. Muhammad, Please, uh, from Nigeria? Name? Yes, it's from Nigeria. All right, so I think uh, Muhammad is currently occupied. We ha also have here Mr. Philip Mondo. So you now have the floor to ask your question to Mayor, to our dear Mayor.
All right. So due to time constraints, I think we could proceed to our uh, other participants here. I think Mr. Thomas Matia is ready here to ask his question. So uh, Mr. Thomas, would you like to uh, raise your question to our uh, dear mayor? Yeah, thank you very much, um, Thomas Matia from Sereliu, southern part of the country, Moyampa district. I appreciate this program so much for attending this program. The question I have here for our co-presenter, uh, I want to know how persons with disability or how this program is going to be inclusive in terms of country level as you said in your presentation, I, I want to know the inclusiveness of this program. Though, as for me, I'm the MNN officer for persons with disability, disability rights and inclusion matters, dreams and alone. So I want to know how this program is going to be inclusive together working with persons with disability in all countries yes, across the Africa. Thank you very much. The moderator, the, the voice of Mr. Thomas not so clear. Can you you can you conclude for me, please? Mr. Hello. Thomas, uh, could you yes, could you try uh summarizing your question in just one line? All right, they, they, all right, okay. Thank you very much. The question here is I want to know how this program is going to be inclusive dealing with persons with disability in, in the youth, because we have a lot of youth who are in the marginalized communities and vulnerable communities living here. In terms of uh, 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 poverty alleviation, these things are found mostly in poorer communities in the country. How this program... Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, of so many program is a uh, effect to the youth for Parliament uh, youth here. So especially on education. So a very poor family here, a very house house of her, her family, one poor family of uh, one poor family. So I, as a government, send uh, their children to the university by no. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, free of charge. So all, all pay by the government. So the school, the university must be based on skill. So, so we also three party of a, a, a partnership, uh, per government or local government, city government of Pariaman, university based on uh, skill and also industry. After they finish the school in the university, this, uh, the son of the poor people directly to work and they have a, a responsibility to help their own family to carry out from the poor people. So, so one of children of the poor family to be agent of change, that's one, to have a, to carry out their family from the, the poor. So, I mean, the family to be a middle class for the next step. So, how the program run is under education. Education can uh, raise the uh, uh, welfare. I mean, the reduce uh, 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 poor. I mean, poverty elevation. The, the program, this one, and also we have uh, some program also um, a school. I mean, uh, uh, training course of job, especially uh, based on skill were needed by the industry. So that will, that uh, the poor people, uh, young um, is their family, one of them will get a job easily, and then they have the, their own family uh, career run from the poor, poor family, that's one. So we have uh, another one. And also all school here in Parliament City is free of chance seen the kindergarten, elementary school, secondary school, so all this free of charge, so that will help uh, all family, uh, they have not uh, extreme expenditure for the for education. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Mayor. So we also have here another question. One last question for this session from our from one of our dear participants. So the question is regarding your poverty elimination program. They want to ask uh, what kind of programs would be accessible for a private without the government support. Can can you repeat again some uh, news news is yes sir no problem so the participant would like to ask what kind of programs would be accessible for a private individual or organization to start without the government support so, kind of yes. initiatives they could do um, uh, even as private individual without the government support yeah um, some of this program uh, not only support by government but also some of uh, the rich people in uh, Priaman who uh, also participate in this program also so the the budgets not only from from the government of Pariaman also from, from from private sector they all the program managed by by director of uh, education of Pariaman and also how to uh, people or young people access to this program so they can access from some website of Pariaman also they could and or they can also uh, go to MPP mall uh, public service in Pariaman and education department of Pariaman the access is very open and also uh, anybody can know what can uh, we do in this government sector Mm -hmm. especially young people is very accessible for this program so this uh, all our policy is almost uh 70 percent is for youth in pariaman this month all right thank you so much so we are seeing here a very active set of participants and we still have plenty of questions to you our yes. dear mayor but we also okay. understand yeah the, uh yeah there are time restrictions so maybe uh, we could just address us to address all of those questions to our dear mayor later on however mm -hmm. at this juncture we would like to ask if we could take a picture with you uh -huh. to our participants please yes. keep your cameras open we all want yes. to see your dazzling smiles yes all I'm, right i'm very happy to speak uh, uh in front of you all the young people and also what we did in Pariaman, I I'm every day with the young people. I play football with the young people. I play, I play, I swim in the beach with the young people. I'm I'm uh, driving with the young people. So I live with them all. So I think I we have to take care of, of them all also. And the the young people will take care of the this city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. So now for our picture taking all right i guess everyone is ready so let me count one two three now for the second slide one more one two three for the third slide so we have we have we play, we have we really have plenty of participants here all right so for the first, I'm sorry, for the fourth slide, all right, Candy, open your cameras so we could take a picture with our dear mayor. All right, one, two, three. For the fifth slide, all right, we would like to see your dancing smile. So please open your cameras. Perfect. So our sixth slide. All right, to so our seventh. And to our eighth, all right. And finally, to so our ninth slide, keep your cameras open. There you go, perfect. So again, thank you so much for your time, Mayor, for gracing us with your presence in tonight's session and also for, for sharing all those strategies with us. So uh, thank you so much. And thank you, now, Santos, we proceed, for the time. 
Thank you so much. And, all, and thank you for, for the all. Thank you very much. Bye. You're always welcome, Mayor. All right. So before we proceed to our breakout rooms, I'd like to ask if everyone is still with us. Yes? Put a thumbs up if you are. All right. So I want to see if you guys are still with us. Come on. Put a thumbs up. All right. So I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. All right. So it's good to know that you guys are still with us. So at this juncture, our organizing committee will divide you to your respective breakout rooms. And once you're with your team members and facilitator, you are instructed to focus your discussion on this guide question. What concrete actions the youth could take starting from small things to be able to contribute to the related sustainable development goals? Again, what concrete actions the youth could take starting from small things to be able to contribute to the related sustainable development goals. So you only have a maximum of five minutes, so make sure to make the most out of the time given. Enjoy and see you again in a bit. And we are back. So uh, I hope you guys had a very fruitful discussion with your team members and facilitator. So currently, we have four groups. But for this presentation, we will first call on the first two. So for the first, for the representative of the first group, you may now uh, take the center stage to share with us the discussions of your group. So may I call on the representative of the first group? So I believe the representative of the first group is Apaya Ebenezer. Mr. Eliezer, all right. So Mr. Eliezer, you may now proceed to share with us what you have learned during the discussion or during the breakout session. Hello, everyone. Hello, Mr. Eliezer. Hello. Yes, so as, as you know, I'm from Haiti. I'm Eliezer Leon. So what we had between our breakout room is we knew how we can make concrete action even if it's little. So we separate from nine friends. So first, the emotion we have to educate people those so we have to meeting up, we have to do um, concrete uh, speak with everyone, do a meet up and talk to everyone in our community to do some changes. We have to run work from family, for school, everywhere we go. And we have to do what we can I say, what we can say recycling part. So we can recycle plastic, we can recycle paper and all of important things that we can find. And we can create helpful tools too with those that can change our community, that will help the society that we are living in, that can make a big difference. So we have to know the good use of social media. So how to be respectful through it so people can really know, can really trust in our movement so everybody can join us to it. So we have to be focused on the sustainability too. And we don't forget, as a part of the community, we don't have to just act, but we can make donation to good stuff, to good uh, movement that we know. It's not only about our mission, our problem, our movement. We can donate to other uh, organizations, other young people like us who want to do something good. 
and we have to promote the clean environmental and the clean plantation so the future people will have somewhere to be safe and somewhere to live free and good with all things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Eliazar, for highlighting what the youth can do, especially with social media. So I agree, uh, social media can be a great tool in actually promoting our advocacies. So to the next group, the second one, may I call on the representative to share with us uh, what you have discussed during your breakout session. So may I ask who is the representative of the second group? Kindly unmute yourself and you may now proceed to discussing the ideas of your group. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm actually uh, for group four, group four, not group two. All right. Group four. Yeah. All right, so group four, you can now uh, present your discussion. Okay, so in in a in a precast session, we, we actually um discuss what and what we need to do. And the first place was um, um, an awareness from the grassroots. You know, over here in Nigeria, we, we believe more in seeing what you can do before we join. Then the second one was um, training, train the trainer program. You know, we believe in, if I can train one, uh, I can train 10. And that 10 can train 100, and 100 can train 8,000. Then, then the third one was, um, we have a business plan. We propose something to the government. We need to start something on our own so that the government can see what we have to offer them so that they can um, come and partner with us. So um, the rallies, you know, enlightenment, using our play cards, posters, you know, maybe jingles, you know, it's something about the youth. The youth love something that will benefit them using tech and social media. So um, the last one was you know, innovative ideas through partnership, you know, to make it come into reality. So I believe if we can channel all of this, it, it will actually make all these SDGs a reality. All right, so thank you so much, Mr. Okwono for that sharing. So we learned from him that a very concrete approach starting with presenting a plan to our government. So that's one of the things that we young people could do in actually initiating this kind of programs. So yeah. great job to all of our groups. To our to the rest of the groups, you still have your moment later on in order to present what your uh, team members have discussed during the breakout session. So now, before we move on to our second speaker, I. I would also like to acknowledge our YouTube live audiences. Thank you very much for staying tuned to our program. Now allow well, me to you. do the honor to introduce to all of you, our second and last speaker. Mr. Andy Allegra has been working for almost 15 years in various areas of community development, pastoral ministry, partnership, peace, and interreligious dialogue. He works in a global organization that protects people in poverty from violence. In his role, he collaborates with churches, faith-based organizations, communities, and faith leaders to end online sexual exploitation of children in the Philippines. Andy also works as a part-time faculty member at Del Sal University, Manila. Apart from these roles, he also serves currently as a secretariat member of the Philippine Interfaith Movement Against Human Trafficking, an executive council member of the Asian Peace Builder Scholarship Alumni Network, a climate a climate reality leader, a National Youth Council member of the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative of the U.S. Embassy in the Philippines, a career fellow of the 2022 Wise Sully Summit, a global fellow of the Golden Institute, an IDOB or Interfaith Dialogue on Violent Extremism Fellow, a Young Water Champion of the South Asia Rainwater Network, an ambassador of the Well Weather international and a member of the Youth Leaders Working Group on preventing and countering violent extremism organized by Prospect Project in ASEAN. Everyone, let us all welcome Mr. Andy Copada Alegre from the National Church Partnerships Lead in 
International Justice Mission Philippines. Let us all give him a round of applause. Hi, everyone. Thank you, RB, for that uh, very generous introduction. I hope you can hear me well. If you can, just thumbs up to know that you can hear me well. You're welcome, sir. We can hear you well. Thank you. I was given 15 minutes for my presentation. I'll try to be on time. Uh, yeah, I, I serve at an international global or global organization that protects people from poverty. I represent other networks as well uh, in a volunteer capacity, serving youth organizations and groups here in the Philippines. Good evening, good morning, and I think good afternoon, all of our uh, global participants joining us tonight, uh, today. So it's actually nighttime here in the Philippines. Uh, allow me to share my screen, I, my PowerPoint. I hope I can share. If you can also thumbs up to see my screen. I hope it's better now. So again, I'm grateful to the organizers for inviting me in presenting this session, uh, which I entitled Thriving Societies, Protecting Vulnerable Groups and Creating uh, Safer Communities. I am presenting uh, my work, our work rather, at International Justice Mission Philippines uh, in combating online sexual exploitation of children and uh, share with you some uh, good practices that uh, we've been doing here in the Philippines in protecting vulnerable groups, especially children, that is in line with uh, Sustainable Development Goal 16. Let me go to the next slide. So I'll present to you a brief background with the organization, our theory of change, a brief also uh, information of the case of uh, cases of violence, especially the online sexual exploitation children here in the Philippines, the role and responses of communities of faith and other communities and the power of collaboration. And of course, uh, what could be the role of young people in line with uh, the Sustainable Development Goal 16. Uh, briefly about our organization, it is a global organization that protects people in poverty from violence. Our vision for 2030 is to rescue millions, protect half a billion, and make justice for the poor who are poor unstoppable. So how do we do this? What are our strategies? And how do we collaborate uh, with uh, various stakeholders. In line with our mission, we do our work by strengthening justice systems. So we collaborate with uh, governments, local governments, wherever we are in countries or states where we are present. And we do our mission by rescuing and restoring victims of violence, bringing criminals to justice, and scaling demand for protection. And that is why I want to focus on protecting communities, vulnerable populations in various communities, especially share with you our work here in the Philippines. So the problem is uh, that we see in our organization is that violence is an everyday threat from people living in poverty. If you're a person uh, in poverty, there could be a uh, less protection mechanism, especially if uh, the rule of law is not implemented. Currently, there are 5 billion people. These are children, women, and men who live outside the protection and benefits of the law. And what we see and what we want to do and what we are doing rather is to protect people in poverty from violence by strengthening the rule of law, by implementing the law uh, in various communities, in various states where we are present. Just to share with you where... Uh, countries where we are present, well, we are present in over 20 communities all over the world. And we focus mainly on cases of human trafficking and gender-based violence. You would see that those uh, states or countries 
where we are uh, in, in, in black are the program offices where we operate and uh, do our work in protecting communities. And those in blue are our advancement offices where we do advocacy and you know, uh, public awareness in, in governments. Because some, especially in some countries where there's demand, such for example, of a case of online sexual exploitation of the children and our headquarters is in the U.S. So uh, in the Philippines, I know there are some participants from the Philippines. Uh, we, are, we have two offices where we are present in Manila, focusing in Luzon, and also in Cebu, where we focus in Visayas and Mindanao. And again, our focus is on the protection of children from online sexual exploitation. So just to align my presentation with uh, an SDG Sustainable Development Tool 16, uh, which uh, is focused on peace, justice, and strong institutions, we want, and we want to challenge everyone who are here to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development tools, provide access to justice for all, all and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at, at all levels from the community to, to government. So you might be asking what is online sexual exploitation of children? If you can raise your hand, if you have heard of this, if you haven't heard of this, that's okay. So in the Philippines, uh, IJM protects children from traffickers who create child sexual exploitation materials or CSEM. And this could be in the form of live stream videos and photos to satisfy online demand of paying sex offenders. So this is basically our working definition of what online sexual exploitation of children, where, you know, children are exposed to trauma, physical, emotional, and psychological trauma from uh, perpetrators who are online. And most of them are actually outside of the country, outside of the Philippines. But there are also perpetrators who are present uh, in, in their homes. Uh, and these can be the local traffickers whom the ch children uh, are, you know, entrusted for their care. I want to share with you our theory of change. Uh, how do we do our work? We believe that strengthening justice systems to enforce the law deters criminals and protects people from violence. If perpetrators of violence, uh, especially on human trafficking, are imprisoned, hundreds and thousands of children victims are protected from cases of violence. So we want that loss are strictly implemented, we want to strengthen the justice system. And that is why we believe that we can protect uh, millions of uh, vulnerable people in poverty from violence. Here in the Philippines, uh, the way how we implement our programs and the way our strategy are implemented, it's through a coordinated strategy of ending or eliminating eliminating online sexual exploitation of children. We do it in three folds. We collaborate and partner with the local law enforcement, the police. We, uh, in rescuing children, investigating cases and in rescuing children. The second is we work with our lawyers. We have lawyers and we collaborate with, uh, with lawyers from the government agencies through legal intervention to prosecute and convict perpetrators, criminals, perpetrators of violence, and through aftercare, where we work with social workers, we work with uh, government and private shelters to help in the care and restoration of survivors of this kind of crime. And of course, we develop, uh, we support uh, environment where I am part of that supportive environment, strengthening those environments to create safer communities uh, for children. And that is through uh, collaborating with various stakeholders and partners here in the Philippines. 
just to share with you the gravity of this kind of crime in various communities here in the Philippines, we had been uh, responding to this kind of case since 2011. And these are the statistics that I want to share with you. Uh, as of November 11 of this year, uh, there are uh, reports and news that during pandemic, uh, there has been an increase of these kind of cases where children are naturally being, you know, learning at home. And these are uh, creating opportunities for perpetrators online to exploit children. Instead of them being at school, they are mostly online at a home where violence can happen. So I want to share with you one model of restoration. We're talking about survivors, uh, especially children. We work with them from the moment of rescue. We assess through our social workers, how can we help them in their healing and restoration? We rehabilitate by partnering various stakeholders, shelters, uh, community activists to help in their rehabilitation. And of course, we want that they can be reintegrated in safer communities and in safer families until such time where they can find freedom and become independent and can continue living uh, in, you know, with full freedom from cases of violence and their experiences of exploitation. So we believe that protection is fueled by a sustainable cycle of justice. Again, I want to reiterate that strengthening justice systems to enforce the law is an effective strategy we, that we do in this kind of crime. We want that criminals are deterred from their uh, criminal activities uh, by convicting them of the crime that they committed. And of course, protecting people from violence through collaboration of various stakeholders can be in the local level where we uh, implement protection strategies and to a higher level of advocacy of implementing laws that protects a group from violence. We believe that a community also of younger generations, us, I, as part of the younger generation, we can create awareness, participate in prevention, bringing healing and restoration to OSEC survivors. I just want to present to you three models of collaboration and partnerships. I lead search partnerships and partnerships with faith-based organizations from community level to the national level. So one of the one of our example of a successful collaboration is the Philippine Interfaith Movement Against Human Trafficking. Online sexual exploitation of children is a form of human trafficking. It's a threat to children. And we work with various faith communities. As an example, the three Christian church councils here in the Philippines collaborating against human trafficking. So this is an example of a mission of the Philippine Interfaith Movement Against Human Trafficking. We want the communities of faith work together to champion the eradication of human trafficking in the Philippines and to realize fullness of life. One of the activities also that we collaborate with churches and faith-based groups is the Freedom Sunday campaign. Uh, it started on September 25 and will end on December 18. It's a collaboration of faith-based organizations to increase awareness in churches and faith communities of this kind of crime, to pray for the protection of children, and of course, to report cases of violence of this kind of crime to law enforcement authorities. And another collaboration is through an organization called Made in Hope. She works Philippines, where they do a lot of awareness uh, programs in communities. Uh, they support children as well. They do a lot of activities like puppetry in communities where they tell stories of this kind of crime, but also stories of survivors, of finding hope amidst uh, exploitation, of finding restoration amidst this kind of violence. And of course, they also provide livelihood to survivors of sex trafficking. Another collaboration is with the Good Shepherd Sisters. You might 
know them from your country where they where they are present as well. These are a group of nuns that are uh, working for the restoration of uh, survivors and victims of uh, sex trafficking. One of our collaboration with them, they've been doing a lot of awareness programs as well in protecting girls when advocating on the rights of the child and of course in helping out survivors of violence in their shelters that they made specially for survivors of sex trafficking or survivors of online sexual exploitation of children. And uh, another right, uh, this is number four, the Philippine Children's Ministries Network. It's also an organization working in schools and in various communities. They do a lot of awareness programs and uh, prevention programs and referral of cases to local authorities. So this is my last slide. I believe I want to uh, throw this question and ask you how can we be involved in protecting communities, especially in making communities safer, not just for children, but vulnerable populations, the indigenous uh, groups, as well as you know some of our brothers and sisters, members of our communities who are uh, persons with disabilities. So how can we be involved? How can we contribute and participate in protecting communities? And that is my last slide. Thank you very much for the time you have given. Thank you, Mr. Allegri. That was an enlightening discussion on sexual exploitation. And I'm sure that your lecture will really drive our young leaders here to also get involved in combating human trafficking and become brave defenders of our communities from violence. So we are now opening the floor for any questions that you may have for Mr. Allegri. For our viewers in YouTube Live, please leave your questions in the comment section and we will assist you in them. So first, I actually saw this uh, question while we were still uh, discussing the topic at hand. So uh, one of the questions that was raised by our dear participant here is how can, uh, how can we help in apprehending the offenders engaged in online exploitation without knowing their identity, for instance? Thank you for that question. That's actually uh, an important intervention where we should know all uh, hotlines, I mean referral systems in cities or communities where we are present. So here in the Philippines, there are hotlines where you can call and refer cases of specifically online sexual exploitation of children. So we don't recommend that you actively, you know, uh, rescue children. You can report to local authorities because they are the ones mandated uh, by, by the government to respond to these kind of cases because sometimes it's risky, right? And safety is a concern. Uh, in the Philippines, there are hotlines like the 1343 hotline where you can report cases of human trafficking. They also respond to cases of online sexual exploiting children. Uh, information are kept confidential, like if you're the one referring to or calling to the hotline uh, but of course they have to verify information and identify the elements of human trafficking for example and of course elements of online sexual exploitation so that you know uh, actions can be done by local law enforcement authorities thank you Thank you so much for that answer, Mr. Allegri. We also have another question here from, I believe from Mr. Okono. Would you like to uh, ask your question directly to our dear speaker? Okay. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Um, Annie. Andy, sorry. Okay. So I actually love what you guys are doing. And um, yeah, over here, um, in, your, in one of your slides, I, I didn't get to see uh, Nigeria as one of your 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 operating countries, okay? So because I something like this, uh, we have a case currently in the court. One of my friend um, about similar issues with um, se sexual um, har harassment, and she was kind of um, alleged she is innocent. That's 
you know, over here, if you have money, you can actually put some stuff to place. So I was like, okay, is there any way your organization can, can actually come in to see if a person can be helped? Uh, currently, he's actually trending on Twitter about, about this particular case, you know. So I don't know if there's a way uh, your community, International Justice Commission, can, you know, lay a voice on it. Yeah, thank, thank you for that question. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have an office or an operation in Nigeria. We are present, however, in Africa, such as in Ghana, in Kenya, yes, uh, where we do uh, specific kind of cases of human trafficking as well. Like in Ghana, for example, uh, we are doing, uh, we are rescuing children from slavery in the fishing industry. So we help okay. local law enforcement authorities, the police, to locate children being held as slaves. And of course, we work with anti-trafficking operatives, the Ghanaian police, to rescue them and bring them to a safer place, right? Uh, okay. I don't know how in Nigeria, but one, when we start operating and we uh, in a country or a state, right, we sort of have an assessment first. Uh, we do send a team for uh, an assessment how the prevalence of human trafficking, specific human trafficking, is uh, prevalent in, in a country. So hopefully we can. I, I, I'm not the CEO, president of our organization. But uh, okay. one thing that you can do in this kind of cases of human trafficking, for example, is to determine in your city what are the actors, who are the actors, the stakeholders present, and how can you further collaborate and help out? I've heard in one of the breakout sessions earlier to do, uh, you know, social media awareness programs on, uh, and you can do that, start a social media sharing information, referral forms, or uh, hotlines where people can be aware where to call. I think that's one of the priorities also. You know the issue, but you don't know also how to, I mean, the hotlines, where to refer uh, victims to, uh, to to shelters, for example. Okay, okay. Thank you. That's, okay, thank you, sir. All right, so thank you, Mr. Andy. So one last question from our participant, uh, particularly from Fadrula from Malaysia. So the question is, do you agree that sexual education covering, com covering combating sexual harassment should be thought at young age? And if so, what are the better planning for it? Personally, I believe that children should be uh, educated in terms of uh, protecting themselves from uh, sexual violence. Like, we have a program in collaboration with partners about uh, uh, about the harms of touching. I believe that when you teach a child in the beginning what what is okay to touch, but also tell them, you know, you you tell them even my my nephews and my nieces. I tell them early at a young age of five, for example, that you you say no. Uh, when someone, especially if a stranger or even a, a relative, for example, wants to touch your private parts, for example, or even hugging or kissing, right? I think those are important for children to be aware as well that this kind of uh, incidents uh, can lead to exploitation, sexual exploitation, because of the mind of a child, you know, some can think that it is okay for him or her to be touched in private parts. And these are what we have seen in victims and survivors of online sexual exploitation children. They realize at the later stage that, oh, what I had been groomed to in the beginning has been acceptable because there's grooming at the early part of sexual exploitation, right? If you undress, for example, it's okay, you will be given a gift or a reward, for example. So that's part of the grooming process. But I would tell communities, stakeholders that we have to teach uh, our children 
uh, what is acceptable and what is not. And, you know, good touch and bad touch, for example, is a project that uh, we teach communities, especially children, what is acceptable and what is not. All right. So thank you so much, Mr. Andy. I'm still seeing plenty of questions from our participants. And it's nice to know that they are very uh, active and interested when it comes to this uh, kinds of kinds of topics. So uh, if you have any other questions that we won't have time to answer, please leave them in the comment section and, or chat box so we can compile them or perhaps send them to our speaker, Mr. Allegra. So once again, thank you, Mr. Allegra, for sharing your knowledge strategies and collaboration ideas on fighting sex trafficking. So uh, for now, we would like to kindly ask if we could take a picture with you. So to our dear participants, kindly uh, keep your cameras open. All right, so let me just count one to three. One, two, three, all right. So for the next slide. One, two, Three, perfect. All right, so for the third slide, one, two, three. All right, so bear with me, so I have a few more slides. One, two, three, perfect. So, all right, so keep your cameras on, please. One, two, three. All right, so we're the sixth slide. One, two, three. For seven. And finally, for those in the eighth slide, one, two, three. All right. So, once again, thank you so much, Mr. Allegra, for that discussion. So, to further discuss the issue, we will now proceed to our respective breakout rooms. So, like earlier, once you're with your team members and facilitator, uh, you will still have to focus on the uh, guide questions or guide question earlier. So what concrete actions the youth could take starting from small things to be able to contribute to the related SDGs. So after that, you are given five minutes to be able to discuss what you have learned or what you have discussed during the breakout session. All right, so again, enjoy the discussion with your team members and see you in a bit. So welcome back to our dear participants. I hope uh, you had a really meaningful discussion with your team members. Earlier, I was with a breakout room six, I think, and they really shared a lot of things about their own experiences and even their own unique solutions in order to address this kind of issues. And that's really great. So we also want uh, you guys to also share those ideas to our other participants here in this room. So we will now call the representatives of the remaining groups two and three for the representative of group two. You may now take the floor and share your group's insights. So I believe uh, Ms. Josephine will be the one to represent her group. Ms. Josephine, you may now uh, unmute and take the floor. All right, um, thank you very much. Actually, I'll be representing group one. All right. Yes, yeah. please. So first of all, um, so first of all, the first thing we discuss about is um the awareness of the SDGs. Like if um um we as youth are aware of it, I think we can bring about the change because the mindset of the youth is one strong weapon. And in any country, if the youths are empowered and are ready to work, then great things can happen. And the other thing is the arrest of everyone involved. That is, um, so many times when these um, um, sex traffickers get caught, they only, um, the police only investigates them and just arrest them, leaving behind all the people that are involved. Because we should know that there are people that are actually um, financing their activities and their missions. So if we can get all of these people in, um, involved, arrested, then I think we can bring about the change we are looking for. And uh, like I said, also youths also can start becoming an agent to bring about the change that we are looking for. The other thing is social media awareness. Sometimes there's so many guys, are, they are not aware of 
of what it seems like like a, a sex trafficking because this sex traffickers sometimes use the influence of money and traveling abroad to get these girls on board so if we use the, the social media as a as an agent to educate these girls on the things that are going on i think we can bring about the change that we are looking for thank you all right so thank you so much miss josephine so for our next group uh, i i believe uh group two has not been able to present their discussions yet is there anyone from group two who would like to uh share their insights group two or group four yeah group two is here all right okay um thank you thank you everyone thank you um santos okay so Okay. All right, you may not um, proceed, please. Okay, so I, I believe change change um start start with us, you know. It is all it's all something we 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 can actually do and all this is um achievable. So in our breakout section, we we talked on uh creating content. So it, it must not be on social media alone. We can go to schools, we can go to the hospitals, we can even go to the prisons. You know, to create this social awareness so that people will get to know about the hazards of um, um, this sexual stuff. Then on the, on the other hand, parents must, must be vigilant you know, to their children, keeping close eyes because children, they are very, very uh, sensitive. Anything they, they tend to see other people doing, you know, they will always want to copy that and try to recreate that. So parents should should be vigilant on their kids. You know, then the third one is uh, creating awareness or partnership with the, the, the different family, the, the different um, health organizations, like the um, Family Health for uh, for Insurance, FHI. You know, they need to know why we need to partner with them. Then the, the last one is parents should be, um, uh, discuss sex with their children, you know, because there's, there's a saying that what you teach your child, it grows with that. So they should be fam uh, they, they should be f um, familiar with the hazards, the, the good and the bad about sex. So that in case the, they are being trapped somewhere, they can say, okay, my mom or dad, you know, I've made mention of this. So I think that will help. Thank you so much much Mr. Okono for that instance. All right, so now we will proceed to group four. And your representative from group four, we would like to hear your thoughts about our topic for tonight. All right, um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm representing group four. Um, group one, two, three, I've almost spoken um, the things we discussed earlier. So I'll just be talking about two points out of um, what they couldn't discuss. And one of the things there is, um, male child education awareness because we realize that sexual exploitation doesn't happen without the male so it's mostly the male that do, do the exploitation so if there should be an avenue where male in the society will be educated like will be given a sense of belonging for them to understand that what they go into is wrong it's really going to go a long way in foretelling um, sexual abuse and next thing we talk about is um inclusion of um, sexual education in school curriculum from primary to secondary school or um, a level like high institutions for example there should be um sections of teaching that to basically um leverage on sexual exploitation this is going to go a long way in telling all these sexual abuses thank you so much Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. All right, so are all groups able to present their uh, discussion already? So I believe one, two, and four were able to present their discussion. How about group three? Any representative from group three? All right, so Mr. Justice, would you like to uh, represent your group? I, I wanted to add up on uh, on group two. He actually forgot one point. 
Uh, we said, we said right, that we're, yeah, we're supposed to introduce laws and policies that protect children, you know? Um, we gave out an example that we have so many uh, things that are going on in the rural areas, in the villages. So it's a matter of introducing bylaws which will help to govern such places, you know? Because uh, there are practices that have been going on for so many years and uh, you find out children who are underage being forced into marriages and others getting pregnant. So we said that uh, we are supposed to be vigilante and actually also try to add, um, try to come to sit down with the whole communities and set up by roles and uh, strengthen such security, uh, such roles so that children are protected. Thank you. Great ideas from Mr. Justin. So thank you so much, all of the groups. Great job to all of you. So I hope you also give yourselves a round of applause for doing a great job for tonight's session. So to, we definitely learn a lot of valuable knowledge and wisdom from today's session with our speakers, but just to highlight some key insights. So again, Mayor Genius Omar shared with us the social and economic programs his government has initiated in order to alleviate poverty in Pariaman City. He gave attention to their job distribution, quality education, sanitation, tourism, and even infrastructure. And this means that the issue of poverty must be addressed from all angles because poverty is a multi-layered issue. And we saw that Mayor Omar made use of data in order to back up the programs he has initiated for their city. Data we know is essential because it gives us a concrete image of what the problem actually looks like and how can we address them more effectively. But more importantly, Mayor Omar emphasized that young people like us should be recognized as a resource in decision-making processes. Young people must be included in important arenas of decision-making and development processes. Development objectives can be met if young people like you and me are involved and taken into account. Because we too are change makers. And like what Mayor Omar said, we are never too young to alleviate poverty. Similarly, Mr. Allegra gave us an overview of the prevalent issue of sexual trafficking in the Philippines. But this issue also exists in other states, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and even in Africa. And we learned that strengthening justice systems to enforce the law deters criminals and protects people from violence. Collaborations and partnerships are also important to address this issue because the young people will not be able to do it ourselves. And that's why we are here. Although we come from different cultures, from different countries, we are still bound by the same social problems like this one. And we are here to learn from one another, to build our network, to share our culture, and of course, to take joint actions. So once again, thank you so much for actively participating to our program. And to formally end our webinar, may we call on tonight's host, Ms. Natasha, to give us the closing remarks. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Santos, who has led this amazing men's session for tonight's event. And also the keynote speakers who delivered their presentation earlier. Distinguished speakers, moderator, promoter, or organizational partners, and volunteers, on behalf of the group, I would like to thank everyone for taking some time to join us this evening. We hope that we learn great insights tonight and share them to great heights. Let us create a better place with no one left behind. I'm Natasha Siandi, and all committee signing off. Thank you, and have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Anyway, uh, don't forget to fill out the attendance form to receive 100 points. So in order to win our grants, please.